I watched that video, and I just can't help but be impressed. So thanks, Ken and Lisa, for sharing that with us. And uh, yeah, you guys, like so many of our missionaries, it just impresses me that you um, are so willing to set aside your smaller story to be part of the larger story of what God is up to, and that you've done so by finding very tangible and practical ways to help uh, people who are in kind of a difficult situation. Uh, but actually, the thing that impressed me the most when I watched that is just how many things you did in one day. I, I can't multitask like that to save my life. I, I figured out, actually, I, I have a phrase I use for this now. It's, uh, my attention is easily monopolized. I have an easily monopolized attention. As soon as I'm focused on something, that is going to consume my world. Nothing else exists. So it's particularly problematic in light of things like mobile phones, smartphones. You know, if I could be in a room with eight people, and if I'm doing something on my phone, I'm completely oblivious to what's going on around me. People could be trying to have a conversation with me. I don't know they're there. They're, they're gone from my, from my consciousness. Uh, sometimes it's helpful, like when I'm writing essays, you know, I can, I can just sit down for 12 hours and just focus in on that. Uh, but it does have its drawbacks. For instance, if I stage a junior high movie night, uh, and I'm watching this movie, and there's a snowman singing about summer, it, and a fight breaks out behind me, I'm not going to notice the fight. So I have to be very careful with how I go about uh, doing these kinds of things. Uh, When I was in fourth grade, I still remember this, the first week of school, the teacher gave us this test that she was saying was supposed to help us to uh, kind of figure out what we remembered from our third grade year. And she gave us a very specific instruction before we started. She said, read through the entire test before you answer any questions. And so I, I lodged that in my brain, read through the entire test before I answer any questions. Great. Well, she passes out the test, and I get the test, and the very first question is a math problem that I really want to solve. And so now I'm completely focused on this math problem. And this is how it goes for the rest of this test. I completely forget that she wanted me to read all of the problems first because there was something that had captured my attention. Well, while I'm doing this, every once in a while I hear around me a rather soft little tap and then kind of a small little thud. This keeps happening all over the room until finally the person next to me, I catch out of the corner of my eye, kind of in dramatic fashion, takes his pencil and just kind of slams it on the desk and then hits the desk really hard with his head. I'm certain he has a concussion or something. Like, I don't know what that was about. But it doesn't matter because I'm focused on my math problem. Well, finally, the teacher calls the whole thing off. She says, all right, about half of you got it, about half of you didn't. And I was in the half that didn't. I had no clue what was going on. If you had read all the way to the end, the last question said, put your pencil and your head down, don't answer any of the other questions on this test. It was a test to see if I'd follow directions. But my attention had been monopolized. It had been taken uh, up by these math problems. I could not focus on anything else. Well, unfortunately, this morning, we actually do have to try to do two things at once. As Dave said, we are starting our global connections emphasis. And so we'll be looking at that this morning. But we are also still in our series in Genesis. And so this week and next week, we'll be going through the next two chapters in the series. Uh, This week, we'll be doing Genesis chapter 11, and next week will be Genesis chapter 12. And these two things we're going to hold together, and we're going to do that all with one hour less sleep. So here we go. Uh, I read a study last year that said this day of the year, heart attacks go up by 10%, so tread carefully when you leave today. We're looking at the story of the Tower of Babel. Turn to Genesis 11 if you have your Bibles. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. And this story is a little bit difficult for us. Uh, Not so much in what it actually says. When we read it in English, it seems to make some sense to us. But the problem with this passage is that it really was designed for an audience that could read Hebrew. It's, It's almost got a poetic form to it. It has a lot of sort of puns that are going on. And so when we read this in English, we tend to miss out a lot. Um, for instance, uh, you know, there's a story of um, the, the man who was trying to give a speech on God's navy. That was his theme. And so the clever way he did that was he had a bunch of words that all ended in ship, you know, like friendship, stewardship, worship. That was God's navy. But he was a missionary and trying to do it to a Japanese audience, and the translator just thought he was absurd. You know, that's, like, that's kind of what we have in front of us. We're coming to this text as English speakers. We don't understand the nuances of the Hebrew language, so we're going to miss some things. But the text is going to help us out a little bit. And as we go, we can try to figure out what this passage is trying to communicate. So go ahead and jump into verse 1, Genesis 11. We're going to read all nine verses here. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. 
The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop here for this, this pun that's going on. Uh, Babel is the, the word that the Hebrews oftentimes use as kind of the seed for Babylon, an empire that would later occupy Israel. So Babylon was very important to Israel's history. It sounds very close to a word, Bilal, which means confused. And so there's a pun in the language, which is basically saying this city name sounds a whole lot like our word for confusion. And so they're essentially saying Babylon is a city of confusion. And we'll come back to that in a little while, but that's kind of the pun that is going on here. So in chapter 1, they, or verse 1, they talk about this idea that they came to this valley of Shinar. So last week we talked about the flood story and the people are beginning to inhabit the world. And they come to this valley that, as best we can guess, was somewhere kind of in the Iran-Iraq area. Somewhere in there um, would have been this valley of Shinar, very close actually to where Babylon would later be situated. Uh, and here in Shinar, people found something that they were very comfortable with and they were very happy with. Uh, and so they began to build their city. They began to build their tower. And the text tells us actually the materials they used, they were baking bricks, which was significant for the Israelites because they didn't really do that. They had stones everywhere, and so they would use stones to make their houses. But this group of people was using a different sort of technology. They'd figured out how to make bricks. And they figured out that they could do some pretty cool things with these bricks. They could stack them really tall. And so they began to kind of use these bricks to make for themselves a city, and in particular, this tower. And again, it's one of those translation things that's difficult to find exactly what they're talking about. But perhaps one of the best uh, explanations that scholars could come up with is that this tower probably resembled an ancient Mesopotamian ziggurat, which was really a, a gigantic structure at the center of a city. It didn't have a lot of function. It was basically just packed with dirt inside, so it wasn't like you could go in there for a town meeting or anything like that. The structure was really meant to ascend toward the heavens for the purpose of essentially meeting with the gods. And the idea wasn't so much that you yourself ascended into heaven to meet God. It was that God would use this really tall ziggurat to set up a dwelling at the top and then walk down the stairs to the people. And the hope was that this God, by walking down to the people, would then bless them, see their efforts, and say, I see that this is good, let me help you. At least that was their hope. Now, as you can kind of imagine, this kind of uh, puts a very human feel to a God. This kind of brings God down to our level, essentially. And that was something that was actually very common uh, for these ancient peoples, and honestly still for us today. It's a lot easier to wrap our minds around a God that kind of looks and acts like we do. A God that kind of functions the way that we do. And so if we can begin to understand God that way, well, then maybe we can control him. Maybe we can get him to do things for us. Or maybe just at least we can get him to go away and leave us alone. <laughs> One of the two. And so this ziggurat then was hopefully to help bring in the gods to make it so that they would bless what was going on. And we don't know if it was exactly like this, but something like this was the aim of what was happening here in the Shinar Valley. These people were beginning to construct something that was very tall and was ascending toward the heavens. Now, in verse 5, God actually does come down kind of like they were intending him to do. But when he comes down, he doesn't give them their blessing. Instead, he confuses their language so much so that they can't continue their project. They're not able to do it. And God says that if they continue to do this as a unified people with one language, they will not be able to fail at what they're doing. They will succeed. They will succeed in their endeavors. Now, as a kid, I was always really baffled by this, because in my mind, the whole point of what they were doing was they were trying to build something so tall that it would ascend straight into the heaven and meet God, like it was some kind of game of like celestial tag. Like, if I can get tall enough, I can tag God, now he's it. <laughs> um, like, something like that. Uh, and then even, even as I understood more about how the, the world works and things like the atmosphere, it's like, okay, this seems silly. If they build a tower that's just too tall, they're just going to suffocate. Like, to me, it always seems strange. God seems fearful. He's afraid that humanity is going to do something that he just can't tolerate. And it looks like he's afraid that this tower is going to somehow get him. And that always didn't make sense to me, but I kind of just let it go. 
And part of the problem was I didn't have a full understanding of how a lot of the Old Testament works. And so if, if your concept of uh, the Babel story is just a really tall tower, we're missing something. We're missing something pretty key. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back two chapters for a moment. We're going to fill in the gaps between uh, what Dave and Russell Crowe talked about last week. And we're going to get to this point where we are this week in Genesis 11, all right? So going back to Genesis 9, you can, you can stay in Genesis 11, we'll walk through it. Going back in Genesis 9, Noah and his sons had just come off the ark, and God was setting up a covenant with his people. And this covenant had some pretty important things attached to it. See, any time in the Old Testament, when you see something you don't understand, when someone does some kind of an action that, as far as we're concerned, is at least morally neutral, but for some reason is condemned, there's a good chance that earlier in the Old Testament, or earlier in the same book, something was explained that helps us understand why that person did something wrong. Now, fortunately for us, we're only 11 chapters into Genesis, so we don't have to go back very far to figure out what are the things that God was asking his people to do that perhaps they weren't doing in the Babel story. And when you get to this covenant with Noah, you start to see kind of what's happening here. In chapter uh, 9, or verse 9, in, or verse 1 in chapter 9 of Genesis, he says this, Then God blesses Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. In that same chapter, six verses later, he says, As for you, be fruitful and increase in number, multiply on the earth and increase upon it. And these commands really all harken back to Genesis 1, when God gave a very similar command to Adam and Eve. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. All right, you're getting the picture here. God is intending for his people to go out, to spread out, to fill the earth. And in this Babel story, we're seeing something a little bit different. What can be perplexing, actually, is chapter 10. Because if you read chapter 10, everything seems to be going according to plan. In chapter 10, you get the story of kind of what happened after Noah. You get the lineage of all the descendants after Noah. His sons and his sons' sons, kind of what happened after that point. And this chapter 10, by the way, is actually really interesting. There's nothing else really like it in the whole body of world literature ever. This is really something quite unique. It's a genealogy. That in of itself isn't very unique. But the genealogy isn't about the people. The people who are at the end of all of the trains of thought represent entire nations, people groups. So essentially, what is happening in Genesis 10 is the Israelites are identifying all of the known nations in the world and tracing their lineage back to Noah. They are all of one descent, essentially. They are all brothers and sisters that come from the same family, and yet they have become so divided. So by all accounts, then, it looks like people are doing exactly what God has asked them to do. They are spreading out. They're taking over. They're all over the place. They are fulfilling God's desire to see the earth inhabited. And some of these places are really significant to uh, the Israelite history. Some places like Egypt, where they had spent some time in slavery. Assyria and Persia, and finally Babylon, where they'd be taken over by foreign nations. I mean, these were significant things. And when Israel was in these difficult situations where they were in slavery or captivity, they had this story to remind them that we are all belonging to the same God. The same God has made us all. We all come from the same place. So if we read Genesis 10, then, it seems like everything's going according to plan. And in the chapter, it actually tells you that a lot of these places had their own languages. Everything seems to be fine. What's confusing here is that Genesis 10 is one of these kind of overarching story chapters. You actually get something similar in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, you kind of get the whole story of creation. And then when you get back to Genesis 2, it kind of takes a step back and zooms in toward humanity. Genesis 10 is doing something similar. It's actually painting what is ultimately going to be most of the course of the history of the Old Testament. And when we get to chapter 11, our story, we're going to zoom way back, all the way back to really before like, any of this is happening in chapter 10. Because if you got the impression that humanity willingly obeyed the will of God from Genesis 10, the story of the Tower of Babel explains otherwise. In the story of the Tower of Babel, you have people who had forgotten or were ignoring or distracted from what God was saying. In fact, they even say, we need to build something or we're going to be scattered. If we don't put up something we can all see, something we can all rally behind, some kind of center, we're going to go all over this world. And who knows, the world's a dangerous place. We're going to get lost. 
We're going to get confused. It isn't safe. And so they began to do something that was directly against what God was up to. So here's the deal with Babel. It isn't that God was afraid of their ziggurat. There was nothing that their ziggurat that could do that could actually threaten God. God was concerned. Because if these people weren't stopped, they'd set out to, they would accomplish exactly what they set out to do. What they set out to do was build a world where God wasn't necessary. See, there comes a point when you've created so, so many structures on your own, so many systems on your own, that you have your own uh, way of living that doesn't require God to be involved anymore. When everything is safe and secure and functions according to a nice systemic order, God's irrelevant. And so as they would continue to create this society, they would create rules, they would create systems, which would inevitably mean that there would be some kind of a class structure. There would be people in power and people who didn't have power, people who had wealth and people who wouldn't have wealth. And these people would all be depending on themselves because they would have built the civilization on the lie that they themselves were in charge of their own destiny, that they essentially were gods unto themselves. This was God's concern. If they didn't fulfill God's purpose in spreading out the earth, they were going to miss out on being in a relationship with him, and it was going to completely destroy them. Now, sometimes I like to imagine that I'm able to ask some of these biblical characters, what are they thinking? Because there's so many times you read the Bible, you're like, seriously, guys? Like, get it together. And so here in this Babel story, I kind of want to do that. I want to ask someone who was there, what happened? Why did you disobey God in this way? Now, this is separating from the text a little bit here. There's nothing in the text that says this, but this is just kind of how human nature functions. So I imagine that they would tell me something kind of like this. They'd say, it wasn't so much that we were trying to disobey God. That wasn't, that wasn't the point. It's just that, well, we had these bricks, and they were really cool. And we could do some really cool things with these bricks. And we could set up these systems, and, and we had so many ideas of what we could do as a unified society in one spot. We were pretty sure that, you know, if we did all this stuff, God would find it was all right, that we did pretty well for ourselves. You know, they were so enraptured in our own story that we just kind of forgot about what God was doing. We kind of forgot about that command. Our attention had been monopolized by something that was right in front of us. What we learn in Genesis 10, ultimately, is that God's will will not be thwarted. Despite the fact that people were not willingly spreading out, God would still make it so that his purpose was done. He confuses their languages, which causes them to have no other choice but to begin to scatter. Because God's will can't be stopped. What we have is the option to join in with what God is doing. And Israel knew this in a pretty profound way. Israel, especially when they were captured by the Babylonian Empire, and this is really fun to look at, would have had this story which seems to be written as kind of a slam against Babylon. I mean, there's so many things in this passage that are just completely anti the Babylonian Empire. Um, for one, uh, the name Babylon itself meant uh, the gate of the gods, essentially. So they believed that their city was some kind of a link to the gods. And we already talked about how for the Israelites, they said, no, your name means confusion. Your whole thing is built on a lie. But even going back, in Babylonian mythology, uh, their city was actually constructed by the gods in the heavens. It was this gift to man. The gods used this brick to create the city in the heavens, which then allowed the city to descend to earth. And so the Babylonian empire then was the will of the gods. It was this, this kind of like pinnacle of achievement. And they prided themselves in their cultures and in their different languages and the different gods that they served and how much variety there was in life and yet how much unity for the Israelites, they saw all this and said, oh, it's, it's impressive, but it's built on a lie. Your greatness is built on a lie. And that lie is that you can be a God unto yourself. But Israel didn't read this just to condemn the Babylonian Empire, because they knew it was too true of their own history. The very reason they ended up captured by a foreign nation to begin with was because they had not been faithful. They had been a nation who over and over again forgot what God was doing among them. Their attention had been monopolized on the smaller stories and the geopolitical struggles, and as a result, they oftentimes turned their back from the God who gave them their prosperity in the first place. And God, who wanted to see this nation be the thing that all people would look to, to know that His name is great, said, I've got to do something else here. Our wills are not in line. My purposes will be accomplished. And to that end... 
you're going to be occupied. In Israel, when they're sitting there in, in Babylon, seeing these condemnations of Babylonian culture, they still have to look in at themselves and say, we did the same thing. We let our attention be monopolized. And God, in his sovereignty, he's still going to have his purposes done at the end of the day. So that's the, that's the story of Babel. What's interesting for us is we don't really feel the same compulsion to fill the earth in the same way because we've actually done so pretty well. You really can't go too many places still that are inhabitable that aren't inhabited. We've, we've filled the earth as far as that goes. Uh, but what has happened, though, is that Jesus set a different kind of command for us, a different kind of scattering, if you will, a different understanding of how we might go and fill the earth. And so if you turn to Matthew 28... This is after Jesus has died and rose again, and he's come back. He's giving us these commands. He's saying these things to us. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." Jesus had a different vision for what his people would do. That vision was that his, his people would go out into the world, that they would scatter, and they would be part of the kingdom construction project that Jesus started. See, for us, we know this. We know that God has gone before us. He is at work in the world. He has gone to all nations, all cultures, all peoples, and is beginning to make himself known there. This is what God is up to. And this is something that God is going to do regardless of our participation, because God's will and purpose cannot be thwarted. But he has given us this incredible privilege to be part of what is happening. He has given us an incredible privilege to join him in helping to make his kingdom known throughout the world. In Cambodia, in Greece, in Ecuador, in all places, God is already at work. And he has invited us to join in. Now, what can sometimes happen for us is this. At least I know this happens for me. Is that uh, consciously, I actually am really excited about missions. I really do love missions. I love these couple weeks of the year when we talk about them. I think it's a fantastic thing. And for a lot of us who've been Christians for a long time, we have that same sentiment. We know that this is what God is up to. And we know it hasn't always been perfect. And there have been some uh, incidences throughout the uh, course of human history. Missionaries have done some strange things. But by and large, and especially within our own uh, group here, we've really been collaborating and working hard to see how it is that we can bring um, to people what they actually need, not just changing their cultures, but really helping them to see within their cultural context what God's kingdom can be like. Some incredible things have been happening. But sometimes when all that's going on, we kind of, we kind of all forget about it. And the reason we forget about it is that there are other things in front of us, things that kind of are a little bit more pressing, that monopolize our attention, if you will. And so sometimes I wonder if a few generations from now, if, if we're not the kind of church that is stepping out into the world and fulfilling this great commission, what would people ask us? They, they would ask us, why did you disobey God? And we'd say, well, we never really meant to. That, that wasn't the point. It wasn't that we were deliberately disobeying God. It's just we had all these things in front of us that we wanted to do. We had a pretty good life. We had a society and a system and a city that we really liked and we were comfortable with. We were even doing good things for God. We were, we were kind of reaching the city for God. We had this incredible structure on the corner of Rose and Bass and Cherry, and we wanted it to be as awesome as possible. And the generation would just say, you got lost. You exchanged the larger story of God for your smaller story for things that were right in front of you, but weren't the massive plan that God has for this world. Say, yeah, they seem like good things at the time, but we missed out on what God was really up to and what God has invited us into. But imagine, imagine a church that got this right, a church that refused to let its attention be monopolized by the immediate things in our lives. A church that said, we want to be about the big story of what God was doing. We want to be about the larger things. So we're going to come together. We're going to pool our resources, our minds, our availability. And we're going to see how we can best impact this world so that God's kingdom can best be made known throughout every region of the globe. 
Imagine a church that came together and said, we are going to focus on what God is really up to, and our stories really only matter when they're part of God's story. See, that's what we have the invitation to be, a church that is working with God. Because God's purpose and will will not be thwarted. He will accomplish bringing his kingdom to all of the nations. I really don't want to see how that's going to happen, though, if we're not part of it. It's probably not going to be good for us. Instead, I want to join in with what God is doing. I want to be present with him. I want to make it so that my attention is not monopolized by the immediate. And so as a church, can we allow ourselves to set aside what's right in front of us, to set aside some of the things that might be keeping us from what God is doing around this world and saying, I want to focus on the big story. I want to focus on what God is really up to. The praise band is going to come on up, and as they're doing so, we're, we're going to you know, just prepare to pray for a little bit. And What we're going to do here uh, is continue to sing about this idea that God is present in this world and that we live for the sake of the world. God has been moving for the sake of the world. And this is a truth that when we grasp, we realize just how big and incredible our God is and understand the privilege of what it means to partner with him. So let's pray together that we could set aside the things that are keeping us from God's will in this world and move toward his incredible plan for what's going on. Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to come this morning to think about how you are already at work. You've gone before us and you are setting yourself up among the nations and you are reaching every people group, every tongue, every culture, and you are revealing yourself there. And God, you have invited us who already understand what your kingdom is like to go and be part of it. Not because we have all the answers or we have everything right, but because we get to be in relationship with you. And that, God, is worth everything. There is nothing else worth our time. So God, help us to be a people who serve you around this globe. Some of us through actually going, hopefully all of us through praying and giving. Because we know that you are a God who can take some small things and turn them into incredible blessings. In your name we pray. Amen.